Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to be breaking down volume 10 of 100 Bullets. In this volume we're going to get an origin story for Agent Graves and how he became the agent. We're going to have the Trust continue to conspire against each other. We're going to have Jack and Lano fight. And we are going to have a long story arc involving one of the Minutemen named Remy Rome and his brother Ronnie Rome, which is kind of interesting. So let's dive into this one. Volume 10, Decade. 100 Bullets, Volume 10, Decade. Written by Brian Azzarello, art by Eduardo Riso. 100 Bullets, Issue 68 and 69. Sleepwalker, Part 1 and 2. These next two issues actually bounce between four different character storylines, but rather than bounce back and forth, I'm just going to go through these one at a time. So firstly, this storyline kicks off with a flashback to the year 1962. Axel Nagel, head of the Nagel family in the Trust, gets a phone call in the middle of the night. When he picks up the phone, it is Augustus Medici on the line. Both Axel and Augustus were young men back then. Axel asks, what is the meaning of this phone call? Augustus informs him that Neil Walker is dead. Neil Walker was the previous agent, the head of the Minutemen back then in the 60s. They will now have to pick a new agent. Later on, Graves had a secret meeting with Augustus Medici and Javier Vasco. They were conspiring to make Graves the next agent of the Minutemen. They shared drinks, and then they discussed the logistics of making sure Graves would get this role. Graves told them, I'm only going to be the agent if the other Minutemen elect me as Walker's replacement. Augustus tells Graves, You are in the spot, Philip. Graves responded, I'm not certain Mr. Shore would agree. Mr. Shore was the then warlord of the Trust, the liaison between the Trust and the Minutemen. And Mr. Shore, he did not fully trust Graves. He even suspected that Graves was maybe responsible for the death of Neil Walker. Augustus told Graves, So what if Shore doesn't want you? Graves to this says, I don't know if we have the votes, and you're a little young to convince the old guard. And knowing Shore, he's already suspicious about Walker's death. He and I, we won't get along. A bit too much of a company man for me, and present company. Augustus told Graves that he should go talk to Shore and feel him out, see where he stands. Later on, in a dark, smoky, shadowy room, Graves meets with Mr. Shore. Shore ushers Graves over to him at a table. He tells him to sit down, have a drink. Graves says he wishes to stand, but Shore tells him, sit your ass down. Shore then asked Graves, you ready to follow Walker? Graves answered, you offering me the Minutemen? Shore's response was, not on your life. Two other heads of the families of the Trust are also in the room. There is Axel Nagel and Roland Dietrich. Roland is the father of Megan Dietrich. Roland asks Graves, Mr. Shore seems to think that you killed Agent Walker. Did you? Graves answers definitively, No, sir. No, Mr. Dietrich, I didn't. Axel Nagel jumped in and added, The autopsy says Walker died of natural causes. Graves to this replies, His heart gave out. Mine won't. Nagel, he then defends Graves, saying, Graves has proven himself time and time again to not just honor, but live by the code of the Minutemen, which is why they've picked him to lead. The Trust doesn't choose the Minutemen, and we won't interfere in who they want as boss. Despite your objections, Mr. Shore, the Minutemen belong to Agent Graves. Eventually, their meeting starts wrapping up. Graves had been officially given the position as agent, and Mr. Shore was not happy. Shore, just as he is about to leave, tells Nagel and Dietrich, Your world just got worse. Nagel questions, Why should I believe that, Mr. Shore? Mr. Shore continues, Because you let your fate fall into the hands of a man who believes fate is his. 
I believe that Graves is in bed with some of your peers, which means the institution of the Minutemen is corrupted. It's no longer the independent police force the Trusts created it to be. With Graves as its agent and his backing of other houses, the Minutemen now have an agenda, which I believe ultimately is a house of his own. Graves, who's still in the room, defends himself to Shore and says, I'm glad we're getting this out in the open, and I respect Mr. Shore here for voicing his concerns while I'm in the room. But I assure both the houses of Dietrich and Nagel, and you, Mr. Shore, I have no interest in taking a house for my own. The Minutemen are what we are. Judge, jury, and executioner. Ultimately, that's all we want to be. Now in the current day, we see an old Axel Nagel enter an elevator. And in the elevator, he is talking with Javier Vasco. Both of them heads of families of the Trust. Both of them have had disagreements over the years that had to be adjudicated by the Minutemen. As both Vasco and Nagel talk in this elevator, their cryptic conversation leads us to believe that Axel somehow made some sort of unexplained mistake in the past, perhaps relating to Graves' elevation to agent, or perhaps something else. Either way, Javier is in this elevator with Axel to kill him, and Axel seems to be aware of it. As they are riding the elevator, Axel looks at the buttons of the various floors, and he comments how it's funny, there's no 13th floor in hotel elevators. When Axel says this, he has a double meaning. He's also referring to how the trust is supposed to have 13 members. Javier responds, 13 is an unlucky number. Axel answers, is that why we've been whittled down to what is it, 10 or 9? Axel is hinting that he knows Javier is going to try and kill him. Javier tells Axel, I believe the plan is to get it to one. Axel responds, which is exactly what we used to be. So, is this how it ends? Javier answers, begins Axel. This is how the end begins. As they continue riding the elevator, Javier Vasco pulls out a little vial of poison. He offers it to Axel and tells him, I think it would be best if you did this yourself. Here. Axel asks, Why should I make it easy for you, Javier? Javier responds, Why not? That is how you've managed to live so long, isn't it? Making things easier for other people? You've always been the great facilitator of the trust. Why bicker when we can talk? Why talk when we can listen? Axel jumps in and says, those are still good questions, you should think. Javier interjects, you should think of your family and the funeral. Axel then asks, what about my family? What of my house? Axel wants to make sure his heirs inherit what is rightfully theirs. Javier responds, stop it. You didn't protest when Augustus carved up the houses of Perez, Madrid, or Carlito. Axel comments, but you did. Javier answers, and I will again. The house of Nagel will stand if I have my way. Look, I'm doing you a favor. You and yours. Axel, he will do what Javier wants. He says, I'll take you at your word, Javier. Javier replies, and I'll take care of your world, Axel. You made a mistake, so what? It's not like you're the only one who has. Several moments later, Javier has long left the elevator. Axel Nagel has indeed taken the poison, and he's now lying on the floor, foaming from the mouth, dying. We now check in on some other characters. We jump over to Megan Dietrich. She is indeed still alive. The last we saw Megan was two issues ago in issue 66, where she got shot in her chest in a restaurant by Victor Ray. It seemed like Megan was a goner, but she did indeed survive that gunshot. Her and her bodyguards have no idea who was responsible for the attempted assassination on her though. She perhaps suspects it is another rival family in the trust. 
Megan in her home is touching where the bullet wound went into her breast. She does not like the scar that it is left behind. Megan, she then gets visited by Augustus Medici. Augustus is holding a summit tomorrow with other members of the Trust. He wants Megan to be there. Augustus has called this meeting to extend an olive branch to everyone else. Augustus tells Megan that she is not the only victim of a botched assassination attempt. He wants the both of them to put these assassination attempts behind them and try to forge through with peace. He says that we both need to demonstrate that the old way of the trust settling its business is dead. Megan responds, just like Fulvio Carlito and his two sons? Who ordered that eye for an eye? Augustus to this answers, The Trust's warlord took it upon himself to deal with the wound before it hemorrhaged. Though his methods were extreme, he did uncover a faction within us that opposes what we all, every head of every house, agreed was to be our future. I need you to agree, for the good of the Trust, that their actions be forgiven. Megan upset yells, I need to know who did this to me! Augustus holds Megan and tells her, I didn't say forgotten. I need you to be strong, Megan. Megan upset says, you need me as an ally, Augustus. Augustus responds, no, I need you. Megan, there are scars that deserve to be worn like a badge of honor, whether they've been gotten on a battlefield, an operating room, or in a restaurant. Augustus then begins unbuttoning Megan's clothes. He tells her, some scars announce to everyone who see them. I beat death. I stared death in the face, and death blinked. Look at me, I beat death! So, what possible chance do you have of beating me? Eventually, Augustus and Megan proceed to remove their clothes and make love. We now jump over to Minuteman, Jack Daw. The last we saw Jack, he was in Atlantic City, making a kind of a living as an underground street fighter. Well, Jack is still continuing with his underground street fights, but because he never loses, he's starting to make less money because no one really wants to gamble on a sure thing because the payout is so low. Jack is talking to some sort of manager friend of his named Rudy. Jack's complaining, he says, that fight last night got me, what, 50 bucks? I need more money, Rudy. Rudy replies, I need that too for you, Jack, but I got nothing. You don't lose. No player puts bank against a sure thing. Jack questions, so what's left for me? Rudy tells him, my advice? And believe me, this tastes like shit coming out of my mouth, but uh, take a dive. I hear there's some new bastard in town crooning the same song about how he can put you down. Jack asks, so I let him? Rudy continues, yeah, and every fool will step up for their third time with you, and then we can start getting rich again. Jack, he thinks on it. He does lament though, man, it's wicked cool being undefeated though. Rudy replies, well then shut up about being underpaid. Elsewhere in Atlantic City, Lano was in town and he is getting himself a big tattoo on his abdomen. Lano then goes to see a man about placing a bet on a fight, a fight that's happening later today with him against Jack. Lano's betting on himself. The bookie, he comments, oh man, that's a lot of bread. I think I could get this covered though. Lano grabs his hands and says, I can give a rat fart what you think. Can you do it? The bookie answers, yeah, 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 I can do it. Later on, we see Jack in his van, preparing for his fight. Jack, he has a pretty messed up way of pumping himself up for battle. He pulls out the gun out of the attache and points it to his head. As Jack contemplates ending his life, eventually the van doors open. It is Jack's friend, Rudy. Rudy seeing Jack with a gun to his head asks, what the fuck? Jack responds, I'm just getting ready for my fight, Rudy. Rudy responds, well, if that's how you do, then do it. Rudy then informs Jack of the latest development. He tells Jack that he should not throw this fight. He should try to win it. Apparently, this out-of-towner that Jack's going to be fighting tonight, well, that guy bet tons of money on himself. So now everyone else is throwing their money on Jack, and the stakes are now pretty high. 
There's lots of money on the table tonight. So Rudy tells Jack, you should try to win this one. Next fight though, then you take a dive. Jack, he replies, I can live with next time. Jack and Rudy then start walking over to where the fight's gonna take place. Jack asks, so what's this guy look like I'm fighting? Rudy answers, a big frickin' brawler, like a big bouncer type. Maybe once he was something, shit, like every other fool you put down. Take what he gives you, but remember, he's not like you, able to take a hit. This guy, he's just a puncher. We see as Jack approaches the fight. His opponent is Lano, and Lano has a brand new tattoo on his stomach. And the tattoo reads, Croatoa. Jack at this point had not been awakened. So when he sees the word Croatoa on Lano's chest, Jack, he just freezes as his mind starts messing with him and memories start pouring back in. So the fight is about to start. Victor and Loop are there as well to watch the fight go down, see how Lano does against Jack. The crowd is anxious to see some punching, but Jack, he is just like a zombie there. Half awake is more like it. The fight begins, and Lano cracks Jack in his face. Lano hits Jack a few more times, but finally Jack starts snapping out of it and fighting back. The two of them are trading blows. Back and forth, back and forth. Jack has memories of his time as a Minuteman start flooding back into his mind. He eventually finally remembers who he was. Lano knocks Jack to the ground, and he tells him, Get up! Jack asks, why should I? Lano replies, Cause I ain't done kicking your ass. Hi, Jack. Jack stands up and says, Yeah, you are. And he tackles Lano. They're traded more blows. Lano's blood is spraying onto people in the crowd. Loop watching comments to Victor, This is messed up, man. Victor responds, You're catching on now, ain't you, little Hughes? Let me tell you what you see. It's pain versus no pain. For one of them, Pain is all he ever feels, while the other can't feel because his head is fucked. Which is which? Ain't figured that out yet. Not like it matters. For both of them, rules are just like bones or promises. Made to be broken. We never learn who won the fight. Maybe it was a draw. But at the end of the issue, Victor and Loop are driving a car, and Lano and Jack are in the back seat, both bloodied, bruised, and tired. Alright, before we continue on with the next story arc, let's look at the landscape of which characters are alive and dead. Within the Trust, we will now put a red X over Axel Nagel, and among the Minutemen, we will now move Jack Daw to be within Lano's camp. Moving on now, 100 Bullets, Issue 70, Awake, Part 1 of 5. In this storyline, we will be introduced to the last remaining Minuteman, Remy Rome, aka The Saint. Remy at this point has still not been reactivated, so he does not remember his Minuteman past. Currently, Remy is working as a meatpacker, and he is living at home with his mother and brother in Cleveland. Remy's brother, Ronnie Rome, is currently working as an enforcer for a small-time mobster named Mimo Palladino. When the issue opens, we see Ronnie in a farmer's market. He is talking to a man there that sells meat. Ronnie and the guy selling meat seem to be old friends, and they are catching up, talking about various things. Ronnie samples some of the meat and says it tastes delicious. Eventually, the guy selling the meat hands Ronnie some money for Ronnie to give to his mobster boss, Mimo Palladino. After a pleasant exchange of words, Ronnie is ready to go. But before he heads off, the guy at the meat counter tells him, uh, One more thing, Ron. This might be out of school, but, uh, your Rolo meats over there? They've been buying Prime for less than choice. It's restaurant grade out of Heinz. Now, I'm not saying it's your brother, but... Ronnie cuts him off and says, You don't have to. So, Ronnie is angry because this guy is telling him that his brother has been stealing meat from his boss over at Heinz Meat, and he has been selling it to others for a discount. 
elsewhere, we see a funeral taking place for Axel Nagel, whom we saw getting killed by Javier Vasco last issue with poison. All the members of the Trust have come to this funeral. Also among them are Lano and Axel's children and heirs, his son Lars Nagel and his daughter Anna Nagel. Once Axel's body is lowered into the ground and the funeral is over, they then all head to a reception. At the reception, Lars and Anna are sitting on a couch, and various members of the Trust are consoling them. Eventually, Augustus calls everyone into a meeting, and Lars and Anna are invited to attend. At the meeting, Augustus addresses the crowd, he says, It was less than a week ago I called us together for a meeting in Atlantic City. Its purpose was to ask your forgiveness and finally put the old way of settling differences to rest. But now we find ourselves a few miles and days away, doing the very same to one of our own. Axel was a great man. For many of us, he was more. A teacher, a voice of reason, a leader. While Augustus is talking, Helena Cotius is whispering to Javier Vasco. The two of them were allied with Fulvio Carlito, who is dead. Fulvio was the one that arranged for the attempted assassination on Augustus that failed. So Helena and Javier are the ones that are secretly against Augustus. Helena tells Javier, I can't believe your... Javier cuts her off and tells her, Let the devil give his due, Helena. Augustus continues, As I was saying, you all know there was an attempt not just on my life, but that of my son. Naturally, because he had the most to gain, I believed Graves was behind it. Our warlord, perhaps because old habits die hard, believed the hit was orchestrated by one of us. It's with a heavy heart I say he was right. But it is with an open one that how Fulvio Carlito was dealt with was wrong. Now Fulvio did not act alone. The other members of the Trust are assuming that maybe Augustus wants revenge on the other families that acted against him, but Augustus tells them all, Graves, he wants us all dead. Well, we can't die anymore. I am not the enemy, and neither are you. What's past is past. There's nothing that can change that. But for the trust to survive, every house must stand together, including the house of Nagel. Javier has maintained that the absorption of other houses during the time of war makes us weaker, not stronger. I regret not having listened to him. Anna, Lars, join us, please. The house of Nagel shall stand. But as you know, each house has one head. I leave it up to the two of you to decide who that shall be. So Augustus is trying to forge a peace, and he is trying to bring Lars and Anna into the fold, and not just simply have the House of Nagel be absorbed like the House of Perez, Madrid, and Carlito were. Elsewhere, over at Heinz Meats, Remy Rome, aka The Saint, he is picking up the meat out for delivery and loading it into the truck, and then he heads off. He then drives to a bar to talk to other meat delivery men. Remy tells them about his messed up plan to rob people that just died. He says, All right, here's what you do. You look in the newspaper. You scope out the old bits. You find some old gummer that's kicked. You look to where the funeral home is, and that'll put you in the right neighborhood, okay? Then you go to the viewing, and you find that little card that says when the service is. And then you show up at the dead guy's house 15 minutes after the funeral starts. And it's a frickin' candy store. Ain't nobody gonna be there. The house is yours for the taking. The other men tell Remy, Jesus, that's some cold-blooded shit. As Remy continues talking, eventually his brother joins him in the bar. His brother tells Remy, we need to talk. The two of them head outside. Ronnie tosses his brother Remy to a wall. Ronnie, pissed at his brother, says, You're stealing meat from work again? You son of a bitch. Remy denies it, but Ronnie knows it's true. Tells his brother, Look, there's only so many times I can cover for you. Mr. Paladino, he owns a piece of Heinz Meats. Remy to this replies, Mimo Paladino owns a piece of frickin' everything as far as I can see. Everyone except me. Ronnie angry says, And you know why? Remy jokes, Cuz... 
you don't want a piece of me. Eventually, Ronnie goes from anger to mild disappointment to a little bit of laughter. He tells his brother, man, you are so messed up in the head, man. Look, Remy, no more, okay? Heinz will get wise, and then he'll go to Mimo, and then it'll be a mess. Remy says, yeah, okay, man, it was the last time. I swear on Mom's life. The two brothers eventually part ways, and they say they're going to see each other at home later. Before they separate, though, Remy says to his brother, Hey, Ronnie, did you get Mom anything? It's her birthday tomorrow. Ronnie did not. Remy continues, Am I the only one that cares about that old bitch? Later on, when Ronnie is finally back at home, he says hello to his mother, he kisses her cheek, and they talk about what's for dinner. Eventually, Ronnie goes out to the garage to throw out some garbage. While he's in the garage, though, Ronnie seems deep in thought, contemplating. He seems concerned about something. We then see one of Agent Graves' attaché briefcases in that garage there. It appears that Graves at some point visited Ronnie and gave him the attaché. And the target inside was of his brother, Remy. 100 Bullets, Issue 71, Awake, Part 2 of 5. Remy wakes up at 6.30 in the morning, when his alarm goes off. He then ushers the girl he was spending the night with, named Pammy, to get out. He wants her out of here before his mom sees her. While Remy is escorting the girl out through the kitchen, Ronnie is there in his underwear drinking coffee. Ronnie asks his brother, what is Pammy doing here? God damn, you dumbass, if Ma wakes up and sees her, she'll have a frickin' hemorrhage. Remy eventually gets Pammy out the door. Before he leaves, though, he tells his brother, Hey, Ronnie, make sure you're home for dinner, okay? Ronnie annoyed says, I'll be home when I'm home. Remy continues, No, you be home for dinner, for cake. How many times I gotta tell ya? It's Ma's birthday, dumbass. Elsewhere, Lano has a meeting with Crete, Augustus, and Megan Dietrich. Augustus asks Lano, I think yesterday's meeting went rather well. Do you? Lano answers, I do. There's not a house in the trust that believes you're a threat anymore. That should go a long way. Augustus replies, yes, it should. We avert one civil war. Lano cuts in saying, by starting another one. Megan teases Lano saying, you look angry, Lano. Augustus to this says, he always does. It takes getting used to. Megan asks, so you're used to it? Augustus answers, I am. As long as he remains useful. Lano didn't love that remark. He asks, you want to test me? Augustus answers, no, no, of course not. It was a joke, Lano. You've proven yourself to me beyond your actions. Megan then starts messing around. She orders Lano, put your gun to your head. Augustus warns her, Megan. Megan continues, he works for us, no? Nothing we tell him to do should be out of his comfort zone. Lano, he then gets close to Megan. He pulls her right by his face. Lano, he then sticks the gun to his head, but he's aiming it in such a way that if he were to pull the trigger, the bullets would travel through his head and into Megan, killing her. Lano then says menacingly, now tell me to pull the trigger. I think she thinks I'm not on your side, that maybe I want the trust dead. If that were true, you all would have been dead yesterday at your little sit down. I would have started with Simone. Lano, he then continues talking to Megan and saying all the brutal ways he would have killed every single member of the trust in that room the day before. After Lano finishes his hypothetical of killing them all, he tells Megan, and then after I killed Augustus, it would have just been you and me, tits. And you would have kicked about 10 minutes ago after I was done screwing you to death. Augustus tries to calm Lano down, saying, Lano. Megan replies, you made your point, Lano. Please put your gun down. Lano does, and then he turns to Augustus and says, okay, now we can talk about what side of the civil war I'm on. Elsewhere at a diner, Ronnie Rome, the mob enforcer, goes to meet with his boss, Mimo Palladino. Mimo kind of looks like a worn-down Danny DeVito kind of type. Now, their conversation in this diner is not very politically correct, so just some forewarning, but it is kind of funny. 
Mimo asks Ronnie. I look like shit, don't I? So dark and puffy under my peeps, huh? Ronnie answers, now that you mention it. Mimo continues, if I don't get freaking eight hours sleep, I look like a goddamn zombie. You know, I'm considering uh, cosmetic surgery. Get this pulled back a bit. You think that's gay? Ronnie answers, nah, well, uh, nah, that ain't gay. Mimo continues, the fuck it ain't. Ronnie responds, well, it's not like you're smoking pole. Mimo continues, nah, that's homo shit, asshole. I'm talking gay here. Ronnie asks, what's the difference? Mimo responds, you know, gays like, uh, you know, uh, taking care of yourself. And homos like, uh, you know, fucking guys. Ronnie tells him, Mimo, you should take care of yourself. Mimo to this says, all right, but if I do, not a word to anybody. Not one. Anyway, finally they turn to business. Mimo says that there's a guy, Larry. He owns a club and he's crying poor. He's not paying up. But Mimo knows that this guy is making good business. He's packing him in that club every night. So Mimo wants Ronnie to make sure that this guy pays up. Mimo then turns the conversation back to his appearance. He asks, So, uh, if I get the work done, you think I'll look better? Ronnie asks, Better? Mimo continues, You know, younger. Ronnie answers, Oh yeah, definitely, both. Before they part ways, Mimo gives Ronnie a pink package. He tells him, Here, it's a dress for your mother. Tell her a happy birthday from me, alright? Over at the Heinz meatpacking plant, Ronnie is cutting up some meat, and he's talking to a friend of his there named Bobby Irolo. Remy's trying to make plans with Bobby for the two of them to meet up later. Bobby says he can't though. It's his wife Tracy's bowling night, and he's got to watch the kids. Remy really wants Bobby to come out, so he convinces Bobby to go down on his wife and pleasure her, as he typically doesn't. And maybe with that, his wife will give him some leeway to head out for the night. We then jump across town to a penthouse suite, where Lars and Anna Nagel are talking. The two of them, brother and sister, need to decide who is going to become the new head of the Nagel family in the trust. Anna jokes, saying, look, I am older. Lars to this says, by a few minutes. Anna, she tells her brother, Lars, this is so more important to you than it is to me. Whatever you decide, I'm good with. As long as you understand we're in this together and nothing changes. Lars tells his sister, I do. Anna replies, that's all I want. Anna then goes out for a night on the town while Lars stays in. Back over to the Rome household, Ronnie returns home and he kisses his mom hello and tells her, happy birthday pretty lady. While Ronnie and his mom are in the kitchen talking and his mom is pinching Ronnie's cheeks, down there in the garage, Remy is there, and he has found the attaché that the Graves gave Ronnie. Ronnie asks his mom where his brother is. His mom answers, he's out in the garage. Ronnie yells out into the garage, Yo, Remy, let's go. Ma's got dinner on the table. Remy carefully puts everything back in the attaché. He replies, Tell her I'll be there in just a sec. Ronnie asks, what are you doing? Remy, holding the gun, answers, It's a surprise! 100 Bullets, Issue 72, Awake, Part 3 of 5. Ronnie and Remy are in the kitchen, celebrating the birthday of their mother. Ronnie looks annoyed the whole time, but Remy seems to be in good spirits. A cake is presented to their mom, and then Remy pulls out the hairdryer as a gift. He tells his mother, sorry I fried the old one, now let me plug it in. And their mom uses the hairdryer to help blow off all the many candles on her cake. Eventually they cut up some of the cake and eat some, and then Remy heads off. Across town over at a fancy looking cocktail lounge, Lars Nagel arrives. He apparently has a reservation. It was a reservation just for one. But the lady that works there tells him, oh, we got a call about an hour ago to add two to your reservation. Lars finds this unusual, but he's going to wait and see who wanted to meet him here. Elsewhere, over at a nightclub, Remy Rome is there with his girlfriend, Pammy, and his friend, Billy, whom we met earlier at the meatpacking plant. 
They are also with another gentleman as well. Billy, who's a married man, is telling a story about how he was hitting on some girl that wasn't his wife. He was trying to get with her, but then she slapped him in the face. And he's complaining about how this was uncalled for. He says, I was just kidding, I told her that. I was just playing around, it was harmless shit. And she got her panties all in a bunch. Pammy, she just thinks Bill's a sleazeball. She tells him, who are you crapping? I see right through you. Let me ask you this, Bobby. If she would have responded favorably to your cheap come on, would you have told her then you was just kidding? You're freaking married, asshole. An asshole, married freaking liar. Billy can't believe this. He turns to Remy and asks, Remy, you gonna let this chick talk to me like this? Remy responds, yeah, I am, because she's right. You want to cheat on your wife? I got no problem with that. I mean, you told me yourself she doesn't even like me, but coming around talking shit about being smacked by some lady because your game is messed up? That's lame city, bro. They talk some more, and then they listen to the band playing at this nightclub for a bit. Elsewhere, we see Ronnie Rome is driving his car. He is actually driving to the very same nightclub his brother Remy is at as the nightclub is the one that the gangster Mimo Palladino wanted Ronnie to collect money from, as the owner of the club has been shorting Mimo. While Ronnie is driving, he gets a phone call from Mimo, who has another problem he needs Ronnie to deal with. Mimo explains that Eddie Hines over at Hines Meets, well, it turns out he's missing meat again, and he's behind on his payments. Mimo finds this very upsetting. He wants Ronnie to go investigate it. And Ronnie is secretly pissed because he believes it is his brother Remy that is responsible for this. Ronnie says he'll deal with it later. He hangs up the phone from Mimo and continues driving to the nightclub. Back over to the nice cocktail lounge that Lars Nagel is drinking at. He eventually gets joined by two members of the trust. There is Javier Vasco and Thibaut Vermeer. They both sit down at the bar with Lars and order some drinks. Back at the nightclub, Remy, Billy, and another man are still watching the show. They are talking about when they are going to break away to discuss business. Remy says, they'll go right after this band finishes up their set. While they continue watching the music, Ronnie Rome enters the nightclub down below. Remy and his friends see Ronnie and they try to wave them down and say hello, but Ronnie seems to ignore them. Outside the nightclub, Agent Graves arrives. He pays a homeless guy a hundred dollars to do something for him. Elsewhere, Anna Nagel, the sister of Lars Nagel, is out on the town. After her evening activities, she returns to her car where she was expecting her driver to be waiting for her. But instead, she finds her dad's butler, Otto. Anna sees Otto and asks, Oh, hi, how are you? Otto answers, it hasn't been easy. I spent most of my life with your father. Anna to this replies, you and daddy were so close, I know. Do you need anything? I thought you were pretty well taken care of. Anna then looks inside the car where she was expecting her driver to be, a guy named Malcolm, and she notices that he's not there. She asks Otto, where is he? Otto answers, he's not here. Anna continues questioning, well, I can see that. Where is he? Otto answers, he's in the woods. Anna suspicious asks, what's he doing there? We see in the car behind the one that Anna came in, Victor and Loop are there, watching. And inside Anna's car, Lano is in the back seat, waiting for her. Lano then answers Anna's question on what this Malcolm is doing in the woods. Lano says, let's just call it sleeping. We see out there in the woods, other Minuteman, Jack Daw, is there. He most likely took this Malcolm down. Lano tells Anna, get in the car. Back over to the nightclub, Ronnie Rome has his meeting with Larry, the club owner that has not been paying his due to Mimo Palladino. Larry's making excuses, he says, look, between the booking, the rent, my liquor license, paying off the cops so I don't get no underage busts, Ronnie cuts him off and says, I don't have time for this, Larry. But Larry just continues, I know, but you gotta make Mimo understand that I'm barely scraping by. Ronnie, he starts getting a little aggressive. He says, I gotta do what for who? First off, I don't work for you, so you don't tell me what to do, you little limp prick. And secondly, it ain't Mimo needs to understand jack shit 
It's you who does. Now, I'm walking out of here with tonight's door, and you can call it square. This Larry seems terrified, but he will most likely comply with Ronnie's wishes. After Ronnie finishes conducting his business with the club owner, he returns back to the nightclub floor where he finds Remy's girlfriend, Pammy, dancing. Ronnie asks her, Hey, where's Remy? Pammy answers, He's out. Ronnie shakes Pam and asks her, Where the hell is he? Pammy, a little frustrated, replies, Jesus, cool your jets. He and Bobby went outside to his car. Out there in the nightclub parking lot, we see Remy and Bobby going to Remy's car. Remy happens to have the gun that was in the attaché briefcase that Graves gave Ronnie earlier. Remy shows it to his friend Bobby. As they are approaching Remy's car, all of a sudden, they see that homeless man that Graves gave $100 to earlier. The homeless man is situated near the trunk of Remy's car, and he is writing something with his finger in the snow on the trunk. Remy, seeing this, yells at the homeless guy saying, Hey, you freaking stinky hobo! You better not be pissing on my ride! The homeless guy runs off. Once the homeless guy leaves, Ronnie finally makes his way over to his brother in his brother's car. Ronnie is pissed because he believes his brother Remy has been stealing some more and causing issues for him now. Ronnie confronts his brother and says, You shit for brains, stupid ass! You goddamn irresponsible half a retard puppy! Remy tells his brother, You shouldn't be talking to me like that, Ronnie. Ronnie asks, Why the hell not? Remy points the gun at Ronnie. While they are talking, we see the homeless guy. He wrote the word Croatoa on the back of Remy's car in the snow. 100 Bullets Issue 73, Awake, Part 4 of 5. Anna is in a car in the back seat with Lano. In the front seat is her dad's old bodyguard, Otto, as well as Minuteman Jack Daw in the passenger seat. They have driven Anna to the cocktail lounge slash bar that her brother Lars Nagel is in this night. Anna arrives just in time to see Lars leaving the bar with Javier Vasco and Thibaut Vermeer. Lano then plants some seeds in Anna's mind. He kind of implies that Lars most likely worked with Javier Vasco and Thibaut Vermeer to kill her father, and that her father did not actually die from a bad heart, it was poison. Lano tells her her brother most likely did this to push their dad out so that Lars could take over his dad's seat in the trust. Now, of course, this is not true. Lano is manipulating Anna to believe this, but Anna is susceptible to believe this lie because she knows her brother seems very gung-ho about taking over their father's seat. Elsewhere, back over to Remy and Ronnie Rome and Bobby. Remy is still pointing the gun at his brother, Ronnie. Bobby asks, are you really going to shoot your brother? Remy answers, I got to, before he shoots me. Ronnie to this says, well, I can't do that when you've got my gun. Remy, who found the attaché that Graves gave his brother, asks Ronnie, did I really ruin your life? Ronnie answers, maybe, maybe you have. Remy to this says, well, that briefcase I found of yours in the garage makes a pretty good case that I did. Ronnie agrees, saying, yeah. It does. Ronnie then asks, What are you even doing out here with Bobby right now? Remy answers, Nothing, we got business. Ronnie, still thinking his brother has been stealing meat, asks, You got something to sell? Remy, defensive questions, What, you keeping tabs on me? Ronnie questions, Did you ruin my life? Remy, he says, Look, what I got in the trunk of my car has nothing to do with your life. Ronnie, still adamant that there must be stolen meat in the car, says, Then open it. I said open your frickin' trunk, asshole. Remy, still holding the gun, throws his keys to his brother and tells him, You open it. Bobby, he starts getting nervous. He doesn't want Ronnie to see what they got in the trunk. Ronnie, he opens the trunk, expecting stolen meat. But instead, he finds something weird. He finds some old porno magazines, only there's like, kids in it or something. Remy answers, They're nudist magazines from the 50s. 
When old man DePesta died up the street, I broke into his home. I was cleaning out his house and I found him. And Bobby here, he's got a thing for this stuff. Ronnie asks Bobby, you into child pornography, Bobby? Bobby gets defensive, he says, what, no, no. Ronnie flipping through the magazine says, this magazine, it's like full of naked kids jumping off logs. What the hell is this? Bobby answers, man, I'm just a collector. Ronnie, he then changes the subject and asks Remy, where's the beef? Remy confused says, what beef? Ronnie elaborates, Heinz, he told Mimo that his beef was missing. Remy explains, well, that has nothing to do with him, at least not this time. It ain't on me. And I ain't. Ruin your life, Ronnie. I swear on my own life, I wouldn't do that. Ronnie, he thinks for a bit. And then he tells Bobby, Bobby, take your smut out of here. And then Ronnie turns to Remy and tells him, all right, you and me, we got to go settle some business of our own. You and me will take this car and Bobby, you drive Pammy home. So as both Remy and Ronnie enter the car, Bobby finally looks at the word on the back of the trunk and he asks Remy and Ronnie, you guys, what's a Croatoa? Bobby then uses his hand to wipe off the word Croatoa from the trunk. We are never shown if Remy Rome actually got activated by hearing the word Croatoa here, but I believe at some point it did take an effect on him. So Remy and Ronnie start driving across town. They are going to try and deal with whoever actually is stealing Heinz meat and ruining Mimo Palladino's business. Ronnie tells his brother, look, if we don't find who's actually stealing this meat now, you're going to get the blame for it, most likely. Remy tells his brother, look, I told you last time, I took uh, six or eight sides of prime beef for my barbecue, and my eyes were bigger than everyone else's stomach, so I sold what I didn't eat. Is that a crime? Ronnie answers, yes, on two levels. I mean, Jesus, Remy, don't you get it? Heinz is robbed. Who's the number one suspect? Oh, well, Remy says, oh, that would probably be Randall. Yeah, he's the night manager. We get most of our deliveries between 3 and 6 a.m. Back over to the Nagel household. Anna has already returned home. And her brother, Lars Nagel, he eventually returns separately. On his way back home, Lars passes by Lano. While this is going down, Victor Ray and Luke Hughes are in a car by themselves, watching the comings and goings of everyone. Eventually, Victor gets a phone call. He picks it up. And on the other line is Agent Graves. Graves asks Victor, Hey, Victor, how are you? Victor answers, Bored. Graves continues, Babysitting and dog walking don't suit you? Victor answers, No, sir, it doesn't. Graves asks, You want me to apologize? Victor answers, No. Graves then asks, What would you like me to do? Victor just tells Graves, Watch your back. The phone call then ends. We see Graves is in a bar with Cole Burns. Cole asks Graves, That was quick. Graves explains, Quick was all it had to be, Cole. Victor's on board. So my interpretation of these events are that Victor he seems to be getting a little bit bored by Lano's games and he wants to maybe go over to Graves' side of things. Meanwhile, over to the Rome brothers. They arrive at the meatpacking plant and they find some of the people that were trying to steal the meat. The Rome brothers park their car and attempt to sneak up on these meat thieves. But their confrontation does not go well. All of a sudden, Remy, he gets jumped from behind and a man with a knife slices him in the face. And another of these meat thieves brandishing a shotgun fires. 100 Bullets, Issue 74, Awake, Part 5 of 5. Agent Graves and Cole Burns are standing by a dock. Cole asks Graves, what are we doing here? Graves answers, what's it feel like, Cole? We're waiting. Cole tells Graves, waiting on a wild card. You know, Graves, that's a sucker's bet. Graves replies, yeah, but you know, I'm the dealer. Over to the penthouse suite where Lars and Anna Nagel are. Anna welcomes her brother home and she gives him a drink. We see a bottle of pills are open and they're lying on the table. Lars thinks this is strange. He tells his sister, pills and booze, that's not fine, Anna. Anna replies, no, no, it's not good. Lars then asks, so what did Lana want? I saw him outside. Anna replies, he wanted to know some things, Lars. 
Lars questions what kind of things. Anna continues, things I should have. Lars, sensing his sister's anger, tells her, hey, hey, take it easy. Anna then confronts her brother, saying, I know that daddy was murdered. How and who did it, too? Lars replies, what, Anna? He was old. His heart gave out. Anna says, it was pushed out. And please, Lars, feign ignorance doesn't become you. Not now. Not after tonight. The trust left it up to us to decide who would head the house of Nagel. It's so convenient there was a vacancy. Lars still doesn't understand what his sister's questioning him on. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. Anna says, I know who you had dinner with. What you were talking about. Anna, she had all these preconceived notions of her brother's guilt and that he was scheming to take their father's place. But Lars says to his sister, Ah, I told them I had no interest in the house. It's yours. Anna, shocked, says, What? Lars continues, Yeah, Thibaut Vermeer and Javier Basco, they didn't agree with my decision, to put it mildly, but I'm not a leader, Anna. I realize that. I hope you'll come to me for advice, but I told them, somebody headstrong, impulsive. The house of Nagel, it belongs to you. Shall we have a toast? Oh shit, Anna just realized that her brother wasn't guilty at all. And she poisoned the champagne he's drinking. She tells her brother, put down the champagne, Lars. Lars? Lars? But it is too late. Lars has already fallen to the floor. He's foaming from his mouth and dying. Anna runs over to her brother. She holds his corpse and she breaks down into tears. She says to herself, Christ, what have I done? And then feeling incredibly guilty, she takes the poison pills and she pops a whole bunch of them into her mouth and then she washes them down with the champagne and she kills herself too, along with her brother. So it seemed like initially the House of Nagel was going to continue with either Lars or Anna, but now it will definitely be just absorbed into the other members of the Trust. Elsewhere, back at the meat plant, Ronnie and Remy were fighting for their life, and Remy, now awoken as a Minuteman, kind of became a psychopath. He killed the people that were attacking them, and now we see him covered in blood, scars on his face, and a hacksaw. He is cutting up the people that attack them in the meat factory there, readying to dispose of their bodies. Ronnie, who I believe got shot and has an injured leg, has crawled over to his brother cutting up these bodies. He asks his bro, Remy, what are you doing? Remy answers, Ronnie, you should have laid out where you were laid out. Let me take care of things. Let me finish here and then I'll get us to a hospital and you can keep your gun. I don't need it. Three months later, we see Ronnie Rome is continuing his rounds. He goes back to that same farmer's market he was at at the beginning of this story arc. Him and the man there talk business. And while he is there for business, Agent Graves approaches him. He asks Ronnie, Can we go for a walk? Elsewhere, over at Augustus Medici's compound, he is talking with Megan Dietrich. Megan tells Augustus, in the wake of Lars and Anna's deaths, the Trust voted almost unanimously to absorb the House of Nagel. Augustus to this says, And despite my dissent, Megan, I accept that decision. Megan replies, You had no choice, you were outvoted. But you got your way, didn't you? Augustus answers, Maybe the other houses realize that my way has always been their way. We are at war. Graves means to bring us down, our former right hand. Cut itself off. What is good for the trust? Megan finishing the sentence says, is good for you. Back over to Agent Graves and Ronnie Rome. Ronnie, talking about his brother, says, I can't do what you ask me to do, Agent Graves. I can't kill my brother. Remy's gone. I haven't seen him in three months. Graves answers, I merely pointed out that someone had ruined your life and provided you with the means to deal with it. I didn't ask you to do anything, Ronnie. Ronnie to this says, yeah, well, even if I say you did, the answer is no. Remy, he didn't mess up my life. Remy is like Remy always is. He's my frickin' brother, so fuck you. Graves tells Ronnie, there's no denying the fact that siding with him has prevented you from moving up the ladder in the Paladino family. That's dangerous. It's made you expendable. Ronnie counters, screw Mimo too. He knows I'm loyal. And Remy, he's family. And you know what? If family ruins your life, well, 
That's what family is. Your life. Graves then asks if Ronnie still has the gun. Ronnie answers, it's been used. Three months ago, three shots, three bodies. And no word, you didn't lie. You want it back? Graves tells him, nah, you keep it. You might need it. While not shown in this particular issue, off panel, Graves asks Ronnie to go to Italy to try and retrieve that painting that everybody wants, the La Morte del Césaire. Graves wants Ronnie to go to Italy to see Echo Memoria to get it back. Elsewhere, we see the gangster Mimo Palladino. He's on a boat, when all of a sudden, urine from a bridge above splashes him in the face. Mimo's confused. He says, what the hell? It ain't supposed to rain today. And we see, up on that bridge, a very scarred Remy Rome is there. He was the one that was peeing off the bridge onto Mimo. Remy is now wearing a suit, and he has officially rejoined Agent Graves. We see Remy is standing beside Cole Burns. Remy's laughing. He tells Cole, Check out that aim, bro. Like old times. Anything in my hand is a frickin' deadly weapon. Eventually, once Remy zips up, he talks to Cole some more. He asks him, So, what do you think is taking the old man so long, Cole? Cole responds, Maybe your older brother wants to think about the offer Graves is making him. Remy to this says, Ronnie, that mope is a man of few thoughts and words. He's strictly yes or screw off. Cole to this says, Well, if it was screw off, we'd be on the road already. Remy, he then figures that his brother is probably taking the jab and gonna go to Italy. He says, Yeah, so I guess Ronnie is going to Italy. I hope he takes her ma. She ain't ever been. 100 Bullets, issue 75. A morality play. This one-shot tale is the final issue in this volume. Agent Graves goes to a Chinese restaurant and gives a young man named Dustin the attaché briefcase, along with the explanation how he has carte blanche immunity. And if he uses the gun and the bullets in the briefcase, he can get away with murder, and he can get revenge on the woman that ruined his life. After some brief conversation, Graves ends by saying, What you do with what I've given you is entirely up to you. Dustin, he asks, If this is true, Graves says, It is. Dustin continues, You've given me the means to get away with murder. Graves to this says, That's true too, but I'm not saying that's what you should do. Dustin confused asks, Well then what are you saying? Graves answers, You tell me. Graves, he then leaves the restaurant. Later on, the next we see Dustin. He is outside of a restaurant called John's Grill Steak and Seafood. The woman that supposedly ruined his life that there was evidence of in the attaché briefcase, she is currently in that restaurant. Dustin, he is sitting outside on a bench, watching it. He is trying to build up the nerve to use the gun and kill this woman, but he doesn't know if he can go through with it. Dustin, he is sweating profusely, deep in thought. Two homeless-looking teenagers come by. They ask Dustin for some money if he has any change. Dustin, he just flashes the gun at them, and they scurry off. The two teenagers, they go further down the street. They eventually sit down and find a place to panhandle at. The two teenagers comment, Can't believe it, that Asian guy pulled a gun on us. The other teenager replies, Yeah, well, he must have thought we were going to, like, rob him or something. Eventually, we see Lano walking down the street. He passes by those teenagers. The male teenager asks, Spare some change. Lano to this says, Yeah, right. Nice boots, Phobo. Lano thinks that these two teenagers here are fake homeless people. They're not really homeless. This guy's got too nice of boots to be homeless. The young fake homeless teenager with the nice boots says to Lano, Fuck you. Lano, he turns back and says, Excuse me? We jump back over to Dustin. He is still sitting on that bench with the attaché briefcase beside him, deciding if he is going to use it. While he is sitting there, a nicely dressed looking gentleman sits beside Dustin. This gentleman seems to be prowling for sex though. He asks Dustin, Say there, you look like you could use a friend. The man puts his arm on Dustin's knee. The man continues, I could be a friend. I mean, I have money, you know. 
just friends. Lano then comes by the man and asks, got a light? The man, a little startled, stands up eventually and uh, tries to light Lano's cigar. Eventually, Lano tells the man, you gotta go. The man continues walking down the street. Lano, he then sits beside Dustin. He seems to know what Dustin is here to do, that Graves gave him the attache. And now Lano is going to try and sway Dustin to not use the gun inside. He tells Dustin, so, uh, the one you're waiting for on inside. Come on, I just want to know. Are you the type of guy who grants the satisfaction of a last meal? Or are you more of a let him die with an empty stomach, son of a bitch? Dustin, a little scared of Lano, starts thinking maybe he's going to have to use this gun on him. Lano tells Dustin, don't even think about it. Before it gets close to mine, I will empty that gun into your face, asshole. You want me to try? Dustin puts the gun back hidden under his jacket. Lano continues talking to Dustin. He says, Smart. That's what you people are. Smart, right? All you Asians with your spelling bees and math. You're one smart fortune cookie. You realize I'm not here to mess with you. I'm just here to talk. So this bitch, she done you wrong, huh? She ruined your life? You got a plan? How are you gonna kill her? I mean, you're not shooting from here, are you? You're gonna get in as close as you can, right? Good idea. Play it cool. Walk towards her calmly, fire a round or two into the window, make some noise, shatter some glass, scatter some people. With no idea who you're shooting at, forks will fly like shit from a goose. Your bird does too, but you don't take your eyes off of her. She's in a blind panic, don't know where to go, you follow, never taking them eyes off, zeroed in like a kamikaze, and then, bam, bam. Headshot, neck snaps, thud on the concrete, game over, good plan, dude. I mean, screw all the mothers. What the hell do they matter, huh? Dustin finally speaks, he asks. Other what? Lano continues. Screw them, like I said, you can't be bothered. Dustin asks, by what? Lano answers, lives, boss. Other lives. We jump back over to those two fake homeless teenagers. They're sitting on the street. It appears that Lano has taken the boots from the one fake homeless teenager and thrown them somewhere else as the guy is now shoeless. The girl, she gets a phone call on her cell phone. Once again, more evidence that she is a fake homeless person. On the phone call, she learns from her friend about a cool band playing tonight over at the Fillmore. She asks how much cover is it gonna be. When she's told the answer, she says, all right, I think we can get that together. While the two teenagers continue to sit on the street, they are eventually visited by that sketchy gentleman that was trying to seduce Dustin earlier. The man first offers to buy them a sandwich, but then he quickly just offers to give them money if they come with him to his car. Both of the teenagers decide to go with the man to make some quick cash. Back over to Lano and Dustin. Lano tells Dustin, There's no denying the fact that this woman that you're trying to kill, she spends a lot of her time now helping others clean up their lives. That was in the attaché too, wasn't it? What she does now? Dustin replies, I already knew what she does. Lano asks Dustin, when did she screw you over anyway? Dustin answers, in med school. Lano asks, did she mean to do it? Dustin answers, yeah. Lano asks, you think she regrets it? Dustin answers, I don't think she thinks about me. Lano tells Dustin, well, there you go. Though she must have a lot on her mind with that clinic and all she's running. Dustin, he starts having some second thoughts. He murmurs to himself, maybe I should sleep on this. Lano asks, why? Dustin answers, a murder's not easy. Lano responds, the hell it ain't. It's so freaking easy. I ain't lying. So easy. You won't know till you do it, but when you do, you'll see. We see those two teenagers have now entered the car with the older gentleman. They seem to start moving on to pleasure him. But then we see something really alarming in the back seat of the car. There is a knife, some duct tape, and some rope. Things might not be going so well for these two young, fake, homeless teenagers. Back over to Dustin and Lano. Dustin's target finally leaves the restaurant. Lano sees her and says, Hey, look, there she is. Nice to see you're a last meal kind of guy. Lano, he begins to head off. Dustin asks Lano, Tell me, in my shoes, what would you do? And Lano, he just shoots back a menacing smile. And that is the end of this issue 
kind of left up for interpretation what it all means. And with this, we end Volume 10 of 100 Bullets. All right, let me go through my thoughts on Volume 10 and the various story arcs in this one. So, first we had the two-issue Sleepwalker story arc, and uh, I liked a few things in here. I liked seeing the origin of Agent Graves and how he became elevated to Agent, and we see some time there in the 1960s and some of the scheming, and Graves seemed to be pretty buddy-buddy with Augustus, and there was a tease that perhaps Graves wanted a house of his own. And uh, this Mr. Shore guy did not seem to want Graves to be Agent, so it was interesting seeing some of their arguing going on there, so some cool teases of what potentially might be the overall conspiracy in 100 Bullets. Then we had the uh, death of Axel Nagel in the present day, which I thought he died in a pretty cool way with Javier Vasco uh, kind of forcing him to take this poison. Although, I wish the book was a little bit more clear on everyone's motivations. I don't really understand exactly why Javier Vasco wanted Axel Nagel killed off. So, I'm having a hard time figuring out, like, why do certain members of the Trust want certain things to happen? It seems like some people in the Trust just want various houses to be eliminated and more power to be consolidated, but some people in the Trust don't seem to want that and want peace. And then we have Graves and Lano, and they're also separate motivations. It's hard to keep things straight sometimes. We had uh, an epic fight between Jack and Lano, which was pretty cool, although I wish we had a definitive winner in that fight. If I had to pick, though, I'd pick Lano. I think he's just a little bit more badass than Jack, and it seems like Lano is unkillable. So, uh, yeah. The next story arc, Awake. We had uh, Remy and Ronnie roam. I liked a couple things in that story arc. So, I liked the relationship between the two brothers. They kind of hate each other, but they still love each other. They uh, have some friendly banter, but uh, they also kind of argue, too. Um, but in the end, at the end of the day, even though um, Ronnie was given the attaché and given a reason to kill his brother Remy, he's not going to do it because he loves his brother so, uh, and, his, and their family, and he's not going to uh, turn on his brother. So I thought that was kind of good. Now, the overall um, meat theft subplot, whatever, don't really care. Um, I really did love, <laughs> I love the scene in the diner with Ronnie and uh, Mimo Paladino. Hilarious, hilarious. You know, this tough gangster Mimo is saying, do my eyes look puffy? I'm thinking of getting, you know, a, a facelift. Is that gay? And then Ronnie's like, no, that's not gay, Mimo. And then Mimo's like, no, fuck it, ain't gay. <laughs> I was dying when I was uh, reading that scene. And Ronnie going, well, it's not like you're smoking pole. <laughs> <laughs> man, I know it's politically incorrect, that scene, but uh, man, that was uh, so funny. I think the funniest thing in 100 Bullets was that scene in the diner between the two of them. Um, beyond that, we also uh, had a uh, Anna and Lars Nagel subplot in there, which I thought was a complete waste of time in a way. If the Trust just wants to consolidate power, just consolidate the power. Instead, we have this kind of unneeded subplot of um, Anna and Lars Nagel, and then the Trust seem to be conspiring to make them kill each other, and they conveniently do so very easily. So I was not buying that subplot, did not love it. The uh, last story arc in here, the Immorality play, was okay. Now, I'm comparing this to some of the past one-shot issues we've had, like Issues 11, Heartbreak, Sunny Side Up, the one with uh, Graves in the diner telling this woman about her daughter that's this child prostitute and she's dead. And it was really dark, but a really great issue. And then there was also issue 27, Idle Chatter with Joe DiMaggio and uh, tying into the JFK conspiracy. Those were so solid that uh, issue 75, a morality play, was uh, the weakest of those, I thought. But there still was some uh, interesting ambiguity in that storyline that made it kind of interesting, although uh, not my favorite. So, on the whole, I think there was a lot of positives in this volume, some funny scenes, some cool interactions, but there's a lot of things I did not love, like the Lars and Anna Nagel subplot and some of the confusing parts and the meat theft subplot as well. So I'm going to give this volume a 7.5 out of 10. Still great stuff, but not my absolute favorite 100 Bullets volume, but still good. <laughs> 
Thank you all for watching, and I'll be back in the future with volume 11, only three volumes left.